it's not fair. You look great. Good, e good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our speakers for our special program this evening. Dr. Deming. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And um, we've got some extra special guests, extra special to me, and uh, they will be to you as well. Uh, so let me introduce you to Mark Ponto. Mark is a radiation therapist. And what that means, we used to call his position radiation therapy technology. So he is one of those guys that uh, his career has been giving radiation treatments to patients. And then most recently, he's become the director of the Radiation Oncology Center in, in Waterloo, uh, Mercy One Waterloo. Yes. And uh, Mark and I have known each other professionally, both being in the field of radiation oncology. But a few years ago, he got to know uh, oncology up close and personal. Uh, not just giving treatments, but uh, his own cancer journey. And with him is his lovely wife, Donna. Donna's had a professional career at special, uh, special Ed and has worked for various schools and AEAs. -E 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 I spelled that wrong. And, <laughs> but has, uh, like every special ed teacher I know, just filled with compassion. And so I've invited Mark and Donna to be with us to just sort of talk about their journey. Their journey is going to be talking about, you know, how do you take care of people with cancer? How do you become a cancer patient? How does your own cancer journey change the way you deal with your profession? Mark was also on uh, a couple of our uh, larger above and beyond cancer journeys, and most recently to Tibet in um, 2018. No, I was not on the show. No, I would have lost it. No, no. Oh, my God. Uh, there we go. So, like a father with too many kids, I get trapped. I lose track. Thank you. So, on two of our journeys to Kilimanjaro and to Nepal, when we went to the trip after the earthquake in 2015. So we're going to talk about that. And Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. And you've got a title to the talk and a sort of an introduction. And we're going to go between uh, reflections, introductions, a little poetry, and conversation. So you're going to start us off. That's great. So um, my working title um, for the program was Daily Bread and an Occasional Sweet. So um, kind of goes back uh, to when I was training for the Kilimanjaro trip. Um, so this is from 2016, actually. I think it was October of 2016. Before I was diagnosed with cancer um, and part of my training um, for the Kilimanjaro. So this is a little dated, but it kind of fits in. So, um, and I think Chris is going to share a picture. Daily bread. I spent my evenings the last six weeks trying to get in shape for the Kilimanjaro trip in January. Most of this involves a two mile walk along the gravel road and a field drive near our house. Aside from the physical benefits of these walks, it also gives me a chance to breathe a little fresh air, enjoy the nature and the landscapes around my home, and clear my head of the stresses of the day. Given my schedule, I have the added bonus that most of the time I'm out and about near dusk. I've gotten to enjoy some amazing fall sunsets. I sometimes think, what a wonderful gift God has given me, painting this beautiful sky. I selfishly think that it's just for me. This past week, we have grieved the loss of two special people. A dear friend of my wife's lost her 20-year-old son, Noah. I heard of the loss of an old schoolmate and good friend, Bruce. Both, we would say, were taken too soon. It reminds me how precious each day is, especially as I grow older and I'm on the downside of 50. That there is such a limit on our, daily, on our earthly days here. It makes me think of each sunset. That beautiful sky is not just for me. It's for everyone that looks to the west at the end of the day, 
ever changing, ever unique to the time and place we see it from. I appreciate now that God's gift to me is not just the sunset, but the whole day, each day, my life one day at a time. It's daily bread, given with grace one day at a time. We're free to do with it what we choose, but make the most of it. Don't take any sunset for granted for your family or friends for the rest of the special people in your life. Enjoy and share that gift, the blessing of each new day. Nice. So even though that was before my cancer diagnosis and before the great trip to Kilimanjaro, I, I uh, really relate to the daily bread. You know, that God doesn't give us a whole loaf of bread. He gives us one day's worth of bread at a time. Um, sometimes that bread is a little hard to swallow. Um, but the next day we get up and we have a whole new piece of bread. And then interspersed with that, if we look for them and we plan on them, there are little sweets every day, too. That's uh it's important yeah. to enjoy the sweets as well. So what you wrote was uh, obviously before your cancer diagnosis. So um, you were introspective, uh, you were uh, optimistic, you were looking for the beauty that comes in, in various things before your cancer. So um, tell us a little bit, just a, a thumbnail of what your cancer diagnosis was and the treatment so that people get, get a, a, a feeling for the magnitude of your cancer diagnosis. And then we're gonna get and talk more philosophical, not about how your cancer was treated particularly, but what you might have recognized as transfer, transformation in the way you think about everything because of your cancer diagnosis. But maybe just give us a, a little bit of a feel for your, your cancer diagnosis and treatment. So um, I was diagnosed in December of 2017. So um, I went on the Kilimanjaro trip in January of that same year, and I probably had my smoldering multiple myeloma at that time. So I get to say that I, I'm a dual participant. I went as a caregiver, but unknowingly, I was a cancer survivor at the time too. Um, I was um, a little lucky in that um, my cancer was fairly early stage. I really was not symptomatic at all. I happened to go to the doctor for my yearly checkup. Um, my older brother had, um, had had to have a cardiac bypass surgery the spring before, even though he was asymptomatic from that at the time. That spurred me to go to the doctor and get a workup for that. And I also ended up with a uh, a cardiac cath and two stents um, about two weeks before my cancer diagnosis. For real. Yeah. yeah. And so your cancer diagnosis, I assume, was a blood test. Was, 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 so, yeah. So I, um, on my yearly physical, one of my blood counts was off just a little bit. Um, and so my doctor decided to work that up more, sent me to a uh, uh, hematologist, work that up more. And it's sort of a long process of you do this blood test, you do this urine test, you do whole body x-rays, um, MR scan, PET scan, and then a bone marrow biopsy. And the bone marrow biopsy was the definitive part yeah. of that. And as you said, we're talking about multiple myeloma, and, but you didn't have dramatic symptoms. It was really uh, the blood test abnormality that led to the workup, that led to the bone marrow biopsy, that led to the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Yeah, I did um, my left proximal clavicle, my collarbone. Um, I thought I had hurt that fall um, working working outside. Um, so I really wasn't too concerned. But then um, when we did all the tests, I actually had a big plastic lesion in my clavicle and actually had radiation to that then um, along with the uh, so multiple myeloma is kind of like a, a leukemia in a way. It's a disease of malignant cells that are in your bone marrow, and they can affect your bone marrow makes normal blood cells, makes blood cells. So having malignant cells in your bone marrow can 
interfere with the manufacture of the normal blood cells. And so that's where the blood counts can be off. And it can also, because it's in the bone marrow, can also involve the cortex or the outer part of the bone. And that's where you can have some pain from the involvement of bones. Um, so you had a course of treatment that included a little bit of radiation from, from your own staff. Yes, which was a little bit surreal. Um, <laughs> You know, we treat patients every day. I've been doing it for 35 years. Um, and to be the person laying on the treatment table, um, I've never been in the room when the beam was on. Um, so um, it is a little bit surreal, but I think it does give me a little bit better perspective of what the, what the patients are going through. And, you know, I try and incorporate that in my daily work as well. So a little bit of radiation and then a whole bunch of there. Yeah, so the initial chemotherapy um, was um, a weekly infusion and then um, an oral pill along with that. Um, did that for a couple months as an induction and then um, went to the University of Iowa to begin the process of having a dual stem cell transplant. So their protocol at the time was they did a double one. Um, they, they did one and then about six weeks later, did a second one. And, and for the, those listening who don't know, it's uh, uh, when we say uh, a transplant, um, it's not the transplant that kills the cancer cells. What precedes the transplant is a lethal dose of chemotherapy that will kill you if you don't give bone marrow back. So, because your cancer is in bone marrow, give enough chemo to kill the cancer cells and, and your normal bone marrow which would lead to certain death if you didn't get a transplant. And is your transplant was yours autologous? Yeah. Yes. So it was his own cells. So they took out his own bone marrow cells, isolated the good stem cells that are going to, do they do from bone marrow or from peripheral? The peripheral. So they, they took off some blood. They actually had a big line. And, 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 and took, took a lot of blood out, searched through his blood in the laboratory for the stem cells. Save saved those, gave him the rest of his blood back, gave him a lethal amount of chemotherapy, oh, he and so he wouldn't die, gave him stem cells that repopulated his bone marrow, and then did it all over again a second time. Um, About six weeks later. Six weeks later. So a dual stem cell transplant, uh, and the result of all of this was... I'm alive and here today. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and what's the, the word that you use to describe your current condition? I'm remission. I'm sure. In, in remission. So, technically, uh, multiple myeloma at this point is not curable. Um, maybe someday in the future it will be. So, um, I forget the exact term, but I'm in the best remission yeah. that you can be. Yeah. So, as Mark described, he's living. living with incurable cancer right now in remission. Doing well, back to work. How much time did you take off work? Um, so about, so it's in three phases. So the first phase was for the collection. So I had um, week-long chemotherapy at the university and then about a week or two off. Um, and then um, as an outpatient, and then they did the harvest. So that was around March because I was in the hospital over my birthday. And then my first stem cell transplant was um, April 4th. Um, and I was off work for about a month for that. Um, and then um, back to work for about a month. And then my second stem cell transplant um, was off about a month for that as well. I twisted the doctor's arm a little bit in that um, you're supposed to, you don't have to be in a bubble or anything, but, but you have to be in a safe environment. And one of the things is I wasn't supposed to do stuff outside, like mow, mow the yard and dig because of the spores and we live out in the country. So I convinced my doctor that it was safer for me to go back to work <laughs> and, and sit in my private office away from anybody else than to be out in the country with all the, all the, all the, all the spores, spores and stuff. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. So, um, obviously, you've been a, a pretty reflective sort of person. How did um, being told you have myeloma and incurable cancer? What what was the weight of that conversation? Um, so it was a weird process because being a medical person and treating patients with multiple myeloma um, and just like everybody else Googling um, and not really knowing where you are in that. So early in my diagnosis, I really didn't didn't know what my prognosis was going to be. So it went from, you know, the two year survival was less than 50% and thinking, well, I might not be around in two years to um, with a good stage and good treatment, um, your, your two year survival was pretty high. Um, so came kind of grappling with, with all of that and coming to the terms in that, I think the first thing was just the shock of it all. Um, and then it was like, let's, let's get to it and we'll get going mm -hmm. with the treatment. So Donna, when you heard the, the words, you know, Mark has multiple myeloma, where were you when you heard that? And what did you think? We were in bed. Like, I didn't know he had gone to the doctor. I didn't know anything, nothing. I, I was like totally in the dark. Like he didn't want to worry. So you're I was in bed that. some night getting ready to go to bed. Yeah, sleep. we were, we're in like, bed. Honey, I should probably yeah. tell you this. And I mean, I, it was a shock. It was like somebody punches you in the gut. And I cried and then I said, will you pray with me? It's really hard. <laughs> So we just held hands and I prayed out loud to God that I don't take this wonderful man for granted. This is so good. Just to get us through this. And he did. And it strengthened my faith and uh, both of us. And we had wonderful support. But I didn't know anything. I didn't until he told me. I didn't know he'd gone to the doctor. I didn't know he had this problem. He hides things very well because <laughs> he doesn't want to worry me, but I want to know. And I was mad. Yeah. yeah so you're dealing with uh, sympathy and empathy and anger. I was. I was like, why didn't you tell me? I need to know this stuff. <laughs> I'm your wife. God dang it. I need to know. I should know. When you want to know? Yes. <laughs> so Donna, let me just jump up. What, how, how do you think you have changed? either spiritually, just philosophically, physically, because of Mark's journey with an incurable cancer? Um, I really, I just, I take his cues. I really do, like I, it was hard going through all that. And now looking back, my daughter told me you struggled mom. I mean, and to me now it's like, it is surreal. Did we go through all of that? I mean, it was our whole summer. It was our whole, I mean, it was just, that was our life living in, I lived in his brother's basement while he was in the hospital in Iowa City. And um, it's just made my faith stronger, too, mm -hmm. I think, and just enjoying each day. And I, I really, I notice um, gifts from God everywhere. I, I see them everywhere. And people tend to forget that yeah and we live out in the country yeah so everywhere i look it's god they're I mean, always he's everywhere. always there for us to see yes we I open mean, our every... eyes and sometimes it takes a slap yeah. upside the face to yeah open and our was, eyes and was... see what's what's there huh? yeah so and i and i took my cues from him it was like he he went through it all so very well and there were other patients on the floor who were struggling just having such problems with their treatments and he was to look at him, he wouldn't have really known that he was dealing with all this. He lost, he shaved his head, you know, so he wouldn't lose it. And um, then he <laughs> disappeared. And when I kissed him, it was like <laughs> kissing his brother. So, so Mark, uh, how 
would you say, um, what are some of the ways in which you have changed because of your cancer journey, either philosophically, spiritually, physically, uh, your approach to life? Um, you know, physically, I'm pretty lucky I haven't had any long-term bad side effects um, from it. I'm, you know, I, I'm not in the best shape I could be, but I'm not in the best shape for me at 62 years old either. So um, I think philosophically, um, I try to not let little things bother me, you know. Um, I... You know, always think I could be a short termer. I'm not going to waste my time on getting upset about a lot of little things. Um, it's hard sometimes to take time for the special things, for for the little daily sweets and um, time together. Um, we still have a busy life, uh, work, and taking care of our place and our grandkids. Um, so it's difficult sometimes to think about um, what I'm going to do with this piece of bread today. But um, overall, I, I think um, part of that too, and you know, we're in, in cancer training for a long time, is that you get that from your patients as well um, about how, how precious life is and how short it is and uh, that it isn't anything to be wasted. Yeah, and, and you don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, every day at work, you get the opportunity to provide comfort and healing to people that are in a situation worse than yours. And um, uh, understanding the beauty of life, and then but also being able to have a profession that is meaningful and you know, being able to help others as part of your, your working profession. I think. For me, that's, that provides such joy on an ongoing basis that, um, you know, if I were in a widget factory, I could probably take pride in making the best widgets possible, but at the end of the day, it's just making widgets. Uh, you know, what you're doing in the, the caring profession, um, I hope gives you a great deal of joy. Um, I, I think so, you know, I've been doing it a long time. Um, it's difficult sometimes and you know, we all sometimes suffer from a little bit of burnout from that, but um, you know, I wouldn't want to really be doing anything else. Um, it's, it's been a, a big joy in my life. Um, not only the patients, but the people that I've worked with are wonderful. Um, you would probably attest to that uh, people in the radiation therapy department are cancer center are sort of a special breed um, about their compassion and caring. So it's just great to work with a wonderful group like that as well. Yeah. And I imagine they were compassionate and caring to you and probably the relationship you had with them. Yes, they were. Help they were you. very supportive through my, my journey. Um, picking up, you know, my duties at work, um, personal things from a lot of them. They, uh, designed a special t-shirt, multiple myeloma t-shirt um, that they all bought one. It was kind of a mini little fundraiser for me. So I, I just can't say enough about them. So I know over the years, and this preceded um, uh, your cancer diagnosis, because as you mentioned, you went on the first trip in 2015 when there was no idea of cancer. The second trip, you, you didn't know you were a cancer survivor at the time, but that was in January of 2017 yep. when we uh, did uh, some medical mission work in Nairobi, Kenya, and then we walked to the summit of Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. together. And as you know, uh, every day, uh, several times a day, we would take time in whatever we were doing, whether it was the mission work or climbing the mountain to share some reflections and some poetry. And um, so uh, you brought in some poems to yeah. share. So um, I am going to let Donna start. Off really? So no. Oh. <laughs> um, and before you start, did you, uh, before uh, you went with Above and Beyond, were you aware of Mary Oliver, John O'Donnell? You I was those? not aware of either one of them. Okay. They both are special on our life now. Okay. I, I'm a big reader. I've been a reader my whole life. And um, 
and I've never really enjoyed poems as much as I have since finding her. And I have enjoyed everyone. Like I read a poem every night before you go to sleep. So, so that's sort of our, our, our bedtime snack. That's our little sweet, 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 sweet read Mary Oliver. A poem. And, um, I, there are so many that I love, but I'm just uh, chose this one. Why I wake early, and, and I'm not as early a riser as you are. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's you are. Well, <laughs> but, but I'm usually up to five thirty, and I just you can't my, qualify as an early yeah, riser. Yeah, and um, I love to go out and run, so I, I love running in the mornings, and everything's fresh, and the birds are singing. I take my dog, and and right. running out in the country is just quiet peaceful and um, so this poem why i wake early hello sun in my face hello you who make the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of the tulips and the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety the best preacher that ever was dear star that just happens to be where you are in the universe to keep us from ever darkness to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now. I start the day in kindness. In kindness. And I think we need that more than world kindness. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just yeah. long through that. So. I like how the sun shines in the window. Even if you don't recognize the beautiful yeah. thing that is coming in your face, I'm right. going to give you this beautiful yes. thing. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I just. Nice. Good good so I have a little story behind my first okay. poem. Oh. So um, in between my first and second transplant, um, at the time, I was doing well, and they had a shortage of beds in the transplant unit. So um, I had to wait for a bed to open up. So I was um, scheduled for early June, and um, you would get the call on Sunday whether there was a bed open on Monday or not. So the first week goes by, I get the call on Sunday and said, sorry, no bed available for Monday. Second week goes by, and, and it's a little frustrating because you have to put your life on hold, get everything arranged to be gone for a month. Um, so, second week goes by. Third week, um, I was out in my workshop working, um, and my mom loved wrens. She always called them her little Jenny wrens. Um, and I, too, in a, in a, in a big believer in little signs from heaven. So I'm working in my workshop. A little wren flies into my workshop, lands about five feet away, and started singing just for about five minutes or so. And then it left and flew away. And in my heart, it was like my mom telling me that that, that was OK. The next morning, I'm at work, and I get a call and said, can you come right away? We've got a bed open for you. So, wow. Um, wow. I kind of feel like that was a sign from her that I was going to be OK. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite poems from Mary Oliver um, called I Happen to Be Standing. I don't know where prayers go or what they do. The cats pray when they sleep, when they sleep half asleep in the sun. Does the possum pray as it crosses the road? The sunflowers, the old black oak growing older every year. I know I can walk through the world along the shore and under the trees with my mind filled with things of little importance. In full attendance, a condition I really call being alive. Is a prayer a gift or a petition, or does it matter? The sunflowers break blaze, maybe that's their way. Maybe the cats are sound asleep, maybe not. All I was thinking this happened to be standing just outside my door with my notebook open which is the way I begin every morning. Then a wren in the privet began to sing. He was positively drenched with enthusiasm. I don't know why, and yet, why not? I wouldn't persuade you from whatever you believe or what you don't. That's your business. But I thought of the wren singing. What could this be if it isn't a prayer? So I listened to my pen. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so Okay, let me, I'll do a, a, um, 
Mary Oliver as well. But let me make sure this was the one you're going to do. Is that one you're going to do tonight? You know, I looked at that, but no. Okay. Because <laughs> you had a special one for the end. So, but this, this is this matches, and we are in the middle of summer, so this is appropriate. This is called the summer day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper. I mean the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her, her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which, what I, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it? you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. I love that line. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. We just all that. have a wild and precious life. And we just recognize it. I just want to say something about Dick. So <laughs> I, um, the first above and beyond trip I was with him was in 2015. So six years ago now. And everywhere that he goes, he would be Mary Oliver or to bless the space between us by John Oliver. So John O'Donnell. John O'Donnell, excuse me. So Dick has this very old frayed copy of this that had been read through thousands of times. And now he comes with this. <laughs> I do too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that book, that book, yeah, it, it covers the corn and the sketch. Yeah. Love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, poetry, you know, it's so, it's, it's, it's prayer. I mean, it really is. And it's, uh, especially the poets that we're referring to bring out the importance of the simple things and being. And John O'Donoghue is also great about talking about crossing of thresholds, whether it's the threshold of birth or marriage or the threshold of death and how sacred those crossings, crossings of threshold are. And um, just to invite us to recognize that no matter who we are and what troubles we may have, we're not alone. And that um, there is great joy to be had in a journey that is going to ultimately lead to our death and that um, you know in many ways the fact that we're not here forever is what makes the day so valuable um, so a little brush with mortality can you know wake us up to these things do you think you are uh, uh, and I'll start with you, Mark, and then ask you, Donna, do you interact with people differently because of, of the journey that you've been on? I think so. Um, maybe it's just getting older, too, but I used to be incredibly shy, and I guess I am a little bit, but um, I think that's brought me out uh, more. Um, and from the 2015 trip, a good friend of ours, Holly Hansen, um, had this mantra about open to life, expecting love, prepared to serve. So when I get the ch chance, I try to be open to life and open to people as well and engage in, in that. So um, especially with the above and beyond, so we have <laughs> above and beyond cancer, engaging to people. Um, just um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Black Hills with my friend doing doing um, my third annual now rebirth day hike. Um, and we happened to bump into a couple from um, Indianapolis and he turned out to be a cancer survivor too. And so we had a long conversation with him and his wife 
um, and it just seemed to be a special moment with that. Whereas maybe before I, I would have engaged with a stranger or something. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Donna? Um, him probably more than me. That's his, I mean, he went, I mean, even though I was there, mm -hmm. I didn't physically go through that he did. I'm just watching him. Um, I think just enjoying life more and I think even having fun more and laughing more and and just our time together, I think, and with our kids and our grandkids and people we love, just um, opening up more and um, not holding things so close, sharing mm -hmm. your pain, you know, because people find it so easy to share your joy, but you need to share your pain because that's where you get your support. You can't but then I don't think, I think you need to yeah. share that. And, and One thing that's hard for, for some people is to accept the help of others. Yes. You know, we always, especially in a given way, want to be the ones giving, want to be the ones giving, we don't want to be receiving. And you know, you can't create a world where somebody always gives and doesn't right. receive. And so sometimes uh, one of the things that some people learn in the process is, you know, there comes a time where accepting the help of others is is being generous and, 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 and allowing someone to get a sense of, of, of feeling good because they're helping you. Mm -hmm. And then right. if you're always refusing the help, they never get the pleasure of helping mm -hmm. them. So that's your gift back to them. Yeah. 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 Let's do some more poetry. Well, I'm going to. Or a Okay. Um, so this is another post from when I was in the hospital. Oh, okay. And so this was while you were in the hospital. Yeah. With one of the so interviews. Chris has some photos to go along with this. So um, stealing from above and beyond cancer a little bit. Um, I this was a post I did on Facebook called "Some Mountains Choose You: A Shared Journey" of, um, about Donna and I. So, so in 2016, when it chose to apply for the Bob and Beyond Cancer trip to Mount Kilimanjaro, Don and I seriously talked about her, her applying as well. Then we did some research about the Achilles climb and what it actually would entail. Seven days, sleeping in a tent, difficult terrain, possibly cold and wet, no shower or bathroom facilities. And in the end, Donna decided that while she would miss me terribly for two weeks, that I should go ahead and do it um, because it really wasn't her thing. Yeah. Um, Donna does like the hike with a few caveats, day hikes, no sleeping on the ground, no extreme conditions. Rustic cabin is okay, but access to heat, water, and at least an outhouse are preferable. Given these, Given these preferences, she has been there by my side on many trips, tent camping at remote sites, trudging through heat, snow, and rain, doing her business behind the tree, hiking the Grand Canyon rim to rim, duct tape blisters and all. I love and admire her strength and tenacity. She's been a trooper through all these adventures, lined minimally, made the best of adverse conditions and shared in joy and in the end we were glad we had that time together and now we're on a new journey one that chooses me and unfortunately chooses down as well all the medical stuff is not her being a mom and a caregiver for both sets of our parents she has more medical experience than she would have hoped for still this is a difficult journey sprung on her unexpectedly it's something she would not have imagined or trained for. She processes these things viscerally. She has enormous empathy. She worries when I'm in pain and am I feeling okay. She's not freaked out by, but occasionally um, quite expecting the port in my chest, the IV tubes sticking out of my neck and my hair loss. There have been frequent tears. She takes little insurance when I say it's all okay and it doesn't much at all. All this, all this is definitely not her thing, but she is there beside me each step of the way. Sitting patiently in waiting rooms and exam and treatment rooms, around hospital beds, holding my hand, taking funny pictures, posting updates on Facebook, taking care of stuff. 
The cancer, the cancer diagnosis, Dr. Tripp's radiation, chemo, more tests, the 16 day climb on my stem cell transplant base camp, no whining, making the best adverse conditions, finding joy in each day, relishing our time together. Next week, we start the next week of the journey, the <coughs> transplant process, chemo, getting my stem cells back, waiting for them to grow, repopulation by my normal cells, a long, slow climb to the summit and back down. Just like Kilimanjaro, I will not be alone. I'll be part of a team, doctors and nurses and support staff, my guide, my porters, my angels in disguise. And as before, I know that I am the support of family, friends, and strangers. With prayers and well wishes and support of so many in so many ways. This time, though, my travel partner will not be 8,000 miles away, wondering how I'm doing, what, worried that I'm okay. She did not choose this journey, but she did choose me. So as long as she is there by my side when I need her most, still wondering how I'm doing, worried that I'm okay. She is a trooper, and I see the blessing in having her as my partner. It's been quite an adventure. There will be adversity. We will find joy in each day, and in the end, sharing the blessings of having me. Years later. So we were watching fireworks this last weekend, and it was just a little surreal that three years ago I was watching fireworks out of my my hospital bed at the University of Iowa. Fourth of July, that was it. your second transplant? Uh, second. Second. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Beautiful writer. Do you have more poetry you want to share? Um, I do want to share a couple slides with Chris's help as well. So, okay. Um, what do you do on the anniversary of your rebirth day? Um, well, first of all, talk about rebirth day. I love the love. So when you get a transplant, when you get your cells back, that's your rebirth day because they basically killed you and they're giving you life back. So you have one birthday and two rebirth days. Two rebirth days. So, so like, how many presents do you have to buy this guy? <laughs> April, 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 4th, April, April 4th is my first rebirth day. Okay. June 27th is my second rebirth day. So I kind of make a comment with that as my rebirth day. Okay. So the first thing that we did was about five weeks after my rebirth day, just a couple weeks after got out of the hospital, um, Backpacker Magazine has this thing called National Summit Day, where you're supposed to summit a mountain. Well, there aren't very many mountains in Iowa, so I decided, and Donna went along with me, to, to hike to the top of Pain Rock and Effigy Mountains, um, just two weeks after I got out of the hospital. So. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. It was seven miles. It was very hot. I was a little yeah, nauseous. Yeah. Um, my heat control didn't work the best, but we, we got there back down. So then, well, I was fine. <laughs> so then, for my for my re first rebirth day, I thought, what can I do? And then I decided, oh, how about climbing? The tallest mountain in Colorado, which is the second highest peak in the lower 48 states. So I convinced a bunch of my crazy friends, um, Sarah, who is a breast cancer survivor, Craig, um, one of my lifelong friends um, from high school, who's a prostate cancer survivor, um, and Sarah's friend, Angie, whose husband um, she lost to um, lymphoma a few years previously. So without much experience, um, we hiked to the top of Mount Albert in um, Colorado, which um, there was suffering, um, there was joy. Um, it was a really a great experience for all of them. Um, for my second rebirth day, um, show something a little closer to home. So we hiked to the top of Eagle Mountain in, in Minnesota, which is the tallest point in the Midwest. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's actually in the boundary waters. You get to the top and look out over the boundary waters. So this time Donna joined me. Um, Angie couldn't make it, but um, Craig's wife, Kathleen, joined us as well. And Sarah was there. And Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Um, and then um, just a couple weeks ago for my third rebirth birthday, we, we um, Sarah and Angie and Craig and I hiked to the top of Black Elk Peak in the Black Hills, which is the tallest point east of the Rockies. 
Okay. So <laughs> good. I was looking because I, I not to contradict what I thought Harney was that's been renamed um, Black Elk. Thank you for telling me. Oh, so it's the it's same. It's the same mount. It's the same mount, but now it has it's a non-traditional. Really Thank you for sharing that. Then, well, really, really, all these years I thought it was hard. <laughs> well, <laughs> we had done it when it was hard. Now it's Black Elk feet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. How about, how about uh, Bear Butte? I did not. We did not. That's that. a, so so that's so a high bit more. Yeah. Have sacred significance. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, Sarah, Sarah actually broke her foot a couple of weeks before we left. She went along on the trip with with us. We took her in spirits to the top of Black Elk Peak. Um, in the photo, you can see her face in her hiking boot. Um, so she went with us on the trip, but to the to the summit. And so, did Mary Oliver and John O'Donohue go with you on your rebirth days? We, we took John O'Donohue a lot on the Colorado trip and um, a little bit um, on the other trips. Great. Okay. Um, what else you want to talk about? <laughs> it's just good to be here with you. Yeah. We could just sit here and chat for hours. We can talk for hours about Nepal and Kilimanjaro. So, so what was uh, the, maybe the most difficult day or night on your uh, Kilimanjaro trip to the summit? Um, the, the summit um, climb was the most difficult, um, and you were in the the old and infirm group as, <laughs> as, as her physician. <laughs> All the, we, had, we were lucky we had seven doctors still on it. We had quite a few. Yeah. And so we divided ourselves on both. So uh, let's give it a little bit of feel. So we get up at like midnight. No, we left at 11. The old and infirm group left at 11. So we uh, went to bed right after dinner. Of course, you don't really sleep well because you know you're going to get up at 11. So to, to begin, we got up like at 10, at 10 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. We on the trail and, and hit the trail at 11 p.m. Yeah. in the dark with the idea that you we would get to the summit at sunrise. And it was cold. It was like 25 degrees when we left. It was windy the whole time. Um, one of the highlights of that, though, was about four o'clock in the morning, we made a water stop. And by then, half of the people's water was frozen. So we shared our water. Um, one of the people was extremely cool. So I know you shared your puppy jacket with her and maybe saved her from hypothermia a little bit. Um, but I think at that point, we all, if it was any one of us alone, we all would have turned around and went back. But as a group, um, it was like, okay, it's four o'clock in the morning. We've been out here in five hours and the cold and the wind. But in two hours, it's going to be light. Um, if we just keep going, and as you say, how do you climb a mountain one step at a time? If you can take one more step. So, I, you know, we made those one more steps. We made it up to the rim as it was getting light, and it was freaking cold. It was about 15 degrees and 40 mile an hour wind. Um, and um, then walked up to the summit. And by that time, the second group had got there. And so uh, we had the opportunity for most of our group to go to the summit as well. The other really amazing thing is we had a very large group. So most groups are like half a dozen or a dozen. We had 40 people. And a lot of them old and infirm. But you know, cancer survivors of various ages and various physical, and we all made it to the rim, everyone. The usual summit rate for people in good shape is about 60%. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we were 100% just because of that love and joy. Yeah. It's pushing yeah. us there. Yeah. Well, the Drake football team did some of the Kelly 75.75% made it. These wow. are young, healthy, fit. And when we go with a group of 40, you know, we're, we're right close to 100%. And it's just finding a reason to do one more step and, and to do. 
slowly. Um, and just that communal. The problem, the problem with young enjoy. athletes is they sometimes go out too fast, and then they, it's like running. Yeah, yeah. So it's nothing yeah. against not nothing against uh, the, the football team, but that's a, a, a condition if you're with a bunch of young fit people, is you tend to go too fast, and then you get altitude sickness. You you go better slow. And, and um, wow. we promise suffering on our trips. Yes, <laughs> there was there Ian. And so people say, what are you going to do? Like. So on my anniversary trip, we try to have a little bit of suffering, little bit of suffering too as well. Okay, let's, let's share another song. poem. Don't Who's up for us? You can go. Oh, oh gosh. Was this the first book we read together? So everybody should own this book. So this is a compilation. Of oh, yeah. See, I did have that. So Mary Oliver died of cancer a couple of years ago. This was one of the latest books that were published. If you want to hold it, oh, yeah, hold it up for a second. So it's a compilation of old and new poetry. I don't think there's a single volume that has all of her work, but this is one of the larger oh, yeah. compilations of her work. Yeah. This one is entitled Died of the Sun. Have you ever seen anything in your life more wonderful than the way the sun every evening, relaxed and easy, floats toward the horizon and into the clouds or the hills where the ruffled sea comes gone? And how it slides again out of the blackness every morning on the other side of the world, like a red flower streaming upward on its heavenly oils, say on a morning early summer, at its perfect imperial distance. And have you ever felt for anything such wild love? Do you think there is anywhere, in any language, a word billowing enough the pleasure that fills you as the sun reaches out, as it warms you as you stand there empty handed? Or have you too turned from this world? Or have you too gone crazy for power? Nice. Sure. As you're saying that, I was thinking of seeing the sun come up when you're down. I just, oh my gosh. There's not a oh, single promise of warmth when you're free. <laughs> yes. But it was a beautiful, beautiful sight, the sun coming up. As we're on the same yeah. other What do you, what do you have, have for us? So um, this is uh, the, the last poem in the book, Thirst, by Mary Oliver. It's called Thirst. Another morning, and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond, and all the way God has given me such beautiful lessons. Oh, Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but salt and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Grant me, in your mercy, a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen and where I will be sent. Yet I already have given I already have given a great many things away, expecting to to be told to pack nothing except the prayers which this thirst I must learn. Nice. Let's give everybody a little flavor of John O'Donoghue. Um, and um, so the, the and he calls his blessings, their poems, their prayers, he calls them blessings. And I'm going to share with you um, the blessing that I share with everyone on that very first day that we head up the mountain. And it's called for a new beginning. So if you want to picture yourself with a group uh, on a mountain getting ready to begin a seven day climb, but it also could be, you know, the beginning of the first day of the rest of your life, like tomorrow and it's called for a new beginning in out of the way places of the heart where your thoughts never think to wander this beginning has been quietly forming waiting until you were ready to emerge for a long time it's watched your desire feeling the emptiness growing inside you noticing how you willed yourself on still unable to leave what you would outgrow. 
and watched you play with the seduction of safety and gray promises that sameness whispered. Heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent and wonder, would you always live like this? Then the delight, when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, and your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm for your soul's senses, the world that awaits you. Well, Mark and Donna, thank you for being part of our video podcast. Thank you for inviting us. Closing remarks, closing words. Um, <laughs> words of wisdom. Every, every day is a blessing. Um, and don't forget to have a sweet every day, too. Whether it's a piece of chocolate or a poem or a hug, um, just to appreciate all the little things in life. Wonderful, wonderful. Seek joy, spread joy. Thank you so much for helping us spread some joy. We're going to turn it back over to Chris to send us out for the night. Thanks, Mark and Donna. That was very touching. Uh, tonight's session was recorded and will be on our YouTube channel at Above and Beyond Cancer. And will also be part of the cancer education series that's on the Mercy One Cancer Center website. So if you just go onto the Cancer Center website, and type in and search for Above and Beyond Cancer, all of the cancer education series will pop up. So we really appreciate Mark and Donna making the trip from Eastern uh, Northeast Iowa. And we will look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Take care, everybody.